And three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon. I am ecstatic to be here right now. I am so excited to watch this really awesome virtual event that we have going on here today, this wonderful live stream with Christopher Kimball. It's going to be an amazing event, something different that we might not have been able to experience um, in the bookstore. So we get to do it in the Milk Street Kitchen today. Uh, my name is McKaylee. I'm a Tattered Cover Bookstore. And for those of you who may be watching who are not in the Denver metro area, Tattered Cover is a bookstore with four locations across Colorado. And we are an independent bookstore. We've been around, it'll be 50 years in 2021 that Tender Cover will have been around. Uh, you guys can always stop in if you're in the Denver area, wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose and come visit us for about 90 minutes or so. Or you can always shop online at tattercover.com. I don't wanna waste a single second here, um, but I do wanna let anybody else know that if you need it, closed captioning is enabled for this video. All you have to do is hover your mouse over the screen you're watching me on right now, click CC, and then the closed captioning will be enabled for those who may want it or need it. Without further ado, I wanna just dive right in here with Christopher Kimball, who's an American chef, editor, publisher, and radio TV personality. He's a co-founder and has been the editor and publisher of America's Test Kitchen. And he created Christopher Kimball's Milk Street in 2016, which is located on Milk Street in Boston. It is wonderful, and he's going to be showing us an amazing new uh, recipe from his new book, Cookish. And so now I am going to turn it over to Christopher, who's going to take it away from here. You know, last time I was at Tatter Cover, it was a snowstorm. <laughs> um, and, oh, no. And, and, and the person who drove me had a white Jaguar which is ideal in snow. I can assure you this is the last car in the world you want to drive in a snowstorm. It was really, it was an interesting trip. I can put it like that. So, that's so there is a awful. benefit of virtual. I don't have to drive through a snowstorm to get the tattered cover. Absolutely. So, We're happy to still have you, even though it's virtual. It's virtual. So, um, cookish, um, you know, we, uh, we travel the world. We talk to home cooks, mostly sometimes chefs. Uh, and we try to think about how they might change the way we cook here at home. And um, we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned that people start with big flavors and uh, then they get to big dishes that have big flavors having started with big flavors. So it's really uh, the cooking itself, what's in between the beginning and the end is actually very, very easy to do. So unlike Northern European cooking, like French cooking, um, you, the technique uh, is less important. You know, French food starts with high quality ingredients that are tend to be kind of boring, root vegetables, meat, et cetera. And then heat technique and time, you, tr you create flavor through heat and technique and you end up with something delicious. Most places in the world don't do that. They start with big flavors like we'll do here in a couple of recipes. And so if you start with big flavors, you can end with big flavors and it makes everything much easier. So. I think most most other cultures outside of Northern Europe have a secret, which is uh, they know how to how to combine ingredients and textures and flavors. Not only does it mean the cooking is easier and often quicker, but it's more interesting because there's there's layers of flavor, right? There's bitter, uh, there's creamy, there's crunchy, uh, there's sweet and sour. In the Middle East, for example, they don't tend to serve dessert after dinner. They tend to have a sweet in the afternoon maybe, but they combine sweetness like fruits with savory. So you get a nice combination. So it's more complex. So cookish is about distilling all that down into very simple recipe, six ingredients, uh, usually one pan, usually 30 minutes or less most of the time uh, to take the learnings from the travels and say, look, here's the essence of this concept of this combination. And uh, so you can, you can do it easily. Hopefully, when you make a recipe out of this book, the next time you make it, you may not need the recipe or you can follow the recipe, but we have sub substitutions, right? So instead of the fish sauce I'm going to use for this uh, shrimp dish, you could use soy sauce, you could do something else. It will tell you what those other things are. So it's really a starting point for doing what everyone wants to do, which is to play with their food at home, right? Is <laughs> to improvise. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get started. So we're going to start with sugar. Um, this is a recipe for caramel shrimp from Vietnam. They use a caramel base for a lot of recipes. Um, and it's not sweet because we're going to take this to a fairly dark caramel, uh, which means that it's going to have a little bit of bitterness to it. 
it's really going to be savory. It's almost a umami flavor as a base, a foundation for the whole recipe. Um, and that's what's so interesting because everybody has sugar and water at home, but we're transforming those in about three minutes. I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit um, into something that makes a great base, even for something like, you know, a relatively fatty shellfish. So we're going to cook this down. Um, you should use a skillet. A skillet's a good way to do uh, a caramel uh, because it's shallow. Uh, it's not deep like it is in a saucepan. You can see the color as it changes, which is really critical. Um, it also goes more quickly, which is nice. I don't recommend you use a nonstick skillet because that dark surface will be hard to see the color of the caramel inside the pan. And once this color starts to go, it's going to go. So caramel is one of those things you want to watch really closely. It'll start to get a really start to smoke. Uh, the color is going to get sort of light caramel. Then it's going to go quickly. So you'll notice I'll pick up the pan a couple of times, take it off the heat, uh, stir it, and it'll continue to get darker. So it's a way of slowing down the process. So that window of when you get the perfect caramel is extended. Um, and again, what's so great about this, uh, talking about improvising, is you could do this with chicken. You could do this with thin strips of pork. You could do this with thin uh, strips of beef. Um, you could do this with vegetables. You could do this with tofu if you wanted. Uh, but the concept uh, is very simple. So we're starting to get a little bit of color. And I would say in about 20 seconds, it'll really start to pick up now. Um, and then you'll see it start to go. And that's when we really have to pay attention. Not a good time to take a phone call or deal with a three-year-old. Here you go. Now it's starting to color. Hopefully you can see that. Um, now I'm going to leave it on the heat. I have it, uh, it's pretty high. Um, now I can smell it, it's starting to smoke. I can smell that sort of, you know, burnt sugar. Um, by the way, this is great. I make a burnt sugar ice cream with this, uh, a very dark caramel, it's really terrific. So, okay, so now it's starting, I'm gonna take it off. It's smoking, I can smell that bitterness, which is what I'm after here, uh, but it's not dark enough. By the way, that's my stovetop beeping. It gets mad when you take the, the pan off the element. Um, so if I took it off now, I would still be a little too sweet. So I want, I want it darker. Um, I want to live dangerously here. Um, so that's getting close. Again, nice and dark. I don't want to burn it. Okay, that's nice and dark. Now I'm going to take this off the heat. I just added three tablespoons of fish sauce. If you leave it on the heat, it'll, um, thicken a little too fast. Okay, now I'm gonna add some shallot um, and Fresno chilies, some ginger and some black pepper. And I'll put that back on the heat in a second. So we're gonna cook that just maybe 30 seconds. So you can see that we haven't really started cooking. We haven't added the shrimp. We have fish sauce, we have caramel, we have Fresno chilies, we have shallots, we have ginger, we have black pepper. So this is a great example of this kind of cooking, which is start with um, start with big ingredients. Um, and then when you get to the shrimp, which is fairly bland, um, you already have built in all the flavor. So shrimp cook really fast. It'll take just a couple of minutes. You want to just get them opaque. Turn the heat up just a little here. So that'll take just a couple of minutes. You want to just get the shrimp opaque um, so they're not translucent and they're done. 
Um, there's always a little bit of carryover cooking too, because the sauce is going to be um, quite hot with all that sugar, that caramel in it. Um, and you can see this whole thing took maybe 10 minutes from start to finish, other than the prep, which is not really that great. Um, and just tremendous flavor. So I didn't have to uh, put it, you know, I didn't have to put a stew in the oven for three hours. I didn't have to saute onions for 20 minutes. I didn't have to, you know, create Maillard reaction with the heat of the pan and the meat or the fish. Um, it was all there at the beginning, really, uh, which makes everything so much easier. So that's pretty much it. We'll cook this by another minute. We'll be done with this recipe. That's awesome. That's amazing. I'm not a chef in the slightest. I was telling Chris earlier that um, it's actually my boyfriend who's the cook in our family. But um, we've got a couple of questions here, and we want to encourage anyone else who um, is watching right now to ask any questions. You can do that easily in the chat that's next to the video there. And so someone wants to know to start us off, what in your opinion makes Cookish different than your other cookbooks so far? Um, well, that has ish at the end. Is that? Is that <laughs> the um, well, it's because, you know, I think the longer you cook, um, the, the simpler you like to cook, right? Because you understand the fundamental formula, right? Or what's going on in a recipe. So cookish is different because we've distilled it all down, reduced the number of ingredients and gotten down to the core thing, which in this case is, you know, shellfish, caramel sauce and a fish sauce. Uh, and, and that's the concept. So we're, it's a reductionist way of cooking, which means you, you still get the big flavor, but you're not doing it with 25 ingredients. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, adding a bunch of spices doesn't take a lot of time, for example. Um, but this is about reducing it down so you get the fundamental concept of a recipe. And that means you can start to play with the recipe, right? So instead of, um, you know, following the sheet music in the orchestra, you know, it's a rock and roll, you know, it's a one, four, five song. So once you get the formula, uh, you can play any number of other songs. Same thing here. So that's it. Um, we're done. Wow. Look at that. Man, it's not even dinner time here and I'm hungry. Yeah, this is uh, one of my favorite dishes. And what, what do you call it? Uh, it's a Vietnamese caramel shrimp. Again, you could substitute other protein for this if you wanted. Uh, but the, the fundamental concept the same. You could change out the fish sauce. You could use soy sauce. Uh, you could use uh, soy sauce with marin, a little bit of sugar. You could use fish sauce with some lime juice if you want, a little bit of sugar. Uh, you could do any number of things. So um, that's the fundamental concept, though, is the caramel sauce, uh, the caramel you're making, some kind of uh, fermented sauce and protein, those three things together. Ginger, you could use lemongrass instead. Uh, you could use a different kind of pepper, for example. Instead of shallots, you could use garlic. So it's, you know, endlessly variable. Wow. I'm just amazed. I, like I said, it's something that is very foreign to me. Um, but I am a, a huge fan, obviously, of eating it. Uh, <laughs> but well, that's good. Yeah, right? I love trying all kinds of different foods. Um, but we have someone else here who wants to know, after so many years of doing this, how do you keep up the inspiration for new recipes? Um, I, I think the inspiration, well, that's a good question. You know, after doing this since the seventies, um, yeah, I'd say I get burnt out because I was cooking uh, new England food mostly, you know, or, or classic American food, however you want to you know, define that. Um, you know, when I got to the point that, uh, you know, I made oatmeal cookies 36 times, you know, <laughs> and I love baking powder biscuits, but I made those 500 times. Uh, you know, I wanted something different. Um, and so by traveling the world, I started to realize that, gee, you know, uh, there are people out there who know a lot more about cooking than I do. Uh, they actually have more interesting ways of thinking about cooking. And so the inspiration comes from the home cook in, you know, in, in, tai, in Taiwan, in Taipei, yeah. or in Chiang Mai, in Thailand, or in Tokyo, or in Oaxaca. You know, when you meet the people, and they all, they all know things I don't know. Uh, and it completely changed my mind about what cooking is, really, uh, because, you know, I was I was trained with essentially the French system, like a lot of people, which is great. I mean, that's but that's just one tiny slice of all the options out there. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, and so there's a lot. I still make a, you know, a French lemon tart and make a lot of things. But 
uh, this style of cooking is totally foreign to mastering the art of French cooking. You know, which didn't use spices, right? I mean, how many spices do you see in that book? Almost none. They don't use handfuls of herbs. Uh, you know, it's not a, um, it's a book where you slowly develop flavor. So the dishes have flavor, but there's, there's vertical depth of flavor, right? Right. So uh, in a great beef bourguignon, you get a lot of flavor, but it's all of the same type of flavor. It's all umami, right? In these dishes, when you have sweet and sour and you have ginger and you have pepper and you have something hot and you have something unctuous and you have something sweet, you have all these other things going on. And so when you put it in your mouth, you go, wow, that's, you know, that's different. Um, and that's, that's why I'm excited about this cooking because not only is it simpler in construct, but it has better flavor. It has more interesting flavor. Let me put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love hearing about your influences from so many different areas um, because I think that just, it brings such character to cooking um, and really just allows you to connect with other people as well. So we have some cooking specific questions um, in particular about the recipe, such as if you substitute pork or chicken for the shrimp, would you pan fry it first and then add the sauce or do you follow the shrimp recipe to the steps? No, if you take, um, like they cook fajitas in Mexico, it's very thinly cut. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can put it right into the sauce and cook it that way as long as it's very thin. You know, th thin, thin strips of boneless, skinless chicken breast will cook in three minutes, you know, on a stir fry, for example. So you just might leave it in a little bit longer. But, you know, if it's big, thick chunks, maybe. But I think what you do is simply cut it very thinly. You might put it in the freezer for 15 or 20 minutes first and then cut something, you know, thinly. That's one way to do it. But, but uh, thin cuts will it'll cook in just minutes. be not a problem at all. Excellent. And then someone asked specifically about the caramel sauce of, I always learned that when making a caramel sauce, you weren't supposed to stir it. You were stirring yours. What is the benefit of doing that? Oh, Lord, here, here I mean, yeah, this is one of those things where you have to do it. You know, you, you can't look at it in the wrong way. You can't breathe on it. You can't do this. You can't do that. I don't know. I just, yeah, you just stir it. I mean, <laughs> I, I know people say, well, it's going to, if you, if you don't watch out, it's going to crystallize. Eh, you know, I don't, I've never had a problem, especially with a skillet. Uh, and then I'm throwing a bunch of fish sauce in there anyway, which yep. will probably dissolve it. So I, I know that traditionally there's a lot of talk about that and uh, I've never found that to really be a problem. So, um, yeah. So then I mean, I, I, I think one, one thing is, I guess in a saucepan, you tend not to touch it until it starts to bubble and things start to dissolve. That's true. But in a skillet, um, I don't have a problem moving it around. <laughs> um, so going back to cookish specifically, um, how do you decide what recipes go into a book and how does the editing process work when trying to eliminate certain recipes? Uh, I don't usually, I'm not usually the person who does that because we have a team of people here at Milk Street. Uh, and by the way, we've been virtual for years. We have people in Australia, we have people uh, in, in, uh, in Spain, we have people on the West Coast. So we have a group of people who do that. Uh, what we do try to do is to start with a real recipe from a real place in the world. So we're not just making it up. I mean, we're, we'll start with it with someone we know or a trip we've taken or maybe a cookbook author we know mm -hmm. and start with a recipe concept like caramel shrimp. My editor was there in, in, in uh, Saigon a year ago and learned it from a guy called Peter Franklin. Actually, he was born in Vietnam, came to the States and then went back to Vietnam later. So this is a recipe he was taught. So we started with that. And then we might have to translate a little bit depending on the ingredients and other things here. But we always try to go back to something that is authentic and give the, the context for it and give credit to the person we learned it from. You know, we're just students, you know, we're not, we're not the experts. So we always try to start with that. And, and then the question is, how do you balance out a book with all the different kinds of cooking? But starting with something that is for real is not just made up is really important, even though, although this recipe is probably not that much different than the original, some recipes, especially if they're hard to find ingredients, you know, you're gonna have to make some adjustments. You know, if you have a Berber, you know, spice mix from Ethiopia, well, every family has their own formula for it. So there is no such thing as a, as a formula for it. So you, you basically have to, you know, make up your own here. So starting with something that is original and authentic is, is, is really important for us, yeah. Absolutely. Hold on one second. I don't think this is working. It's not, oh, um, okay. I, it, it's it's off right now because it okay. was um, distracting people from talking. Oh. They asked to just oh, okay. the two oh. of us speak. Oh, so you turned it off. Okay, I did. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I tried to figure it out. We're having okay. a panic here. I'm okay. so sorry. 
<laughs> totally my fault. It's because it, we had three screens going in. Okay. There was nothing happening with the cooking anymore. So, okay. um, but people do want to know what garnish did you put on top of it there? It looks uh, like those are just scallions. You know, uh, one of the things we did learn, by the way, when we were in Vietnam, is scallion oil. Mm -hmm. You know, you take a bunch of scallions, cut them like this, and then put them in uh, just grapeseed oil, sunflower oil, any, any neutral oil, and heat them up, cook them for a few minutes. Uh, and you have this amazing scallion oil. And that oil uh, is a technique a lot of people use in the world, India in particular, Southeast Asia. You drizzle that oil over the food at the end. Um, it's very similar to like in Chinese cooking, they might put scallions and ginger on top of a dish. And then they put hot, very hot oil, sizzling oil on top. And that brings out the flavor of the ginger or the scallion. So this is a similar concept. Uh, you can also take oil and put in a spice, uh, Aleppo pepper, for example, which is a very fruity pepper. You can put into a couple table or a quarter cup of oil, cook it, warm it for two or three minutes just till the, it infuses the oil, mm -hmm. and then drizzle that over the food at the end. That's another great tip. It's called tarka, T-A-R-K-A. -A. It's, a, it's a tip from uh, some Indian cuisines. So finishing up how you finish a dish uh, is really important. You know. I think the mistake, if, if there is one mistake everybody makes besides not adding enough salt, which is a whole nother issue. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, what is it about salt? Anyway, at the end, you taste the food, unless it's something coming out of the oven, it's baked. Um, you can add a little ginger, you can add a little garlic. If there are herbs in the dish that are cooked, add fresh herbs at the end, the same herbs, right? Add, add a little vinegar at the end, add pomegranate molasses for something sweet and sour at the end, garnish with scallions, you know. Uh, use some toasted sesame seeds to put on the top. Oh, Those nice. little things that adjust flavor can take a mediocre dish and, and turn into a great dish, especially the salt. If you under, I, I'm just going to bang the thing. If you <laughs> under salt your food, it's just not going to, you know, th there is such a thing as unsalted bread in Italy, which, uh, you know, I, I do not understand. Maybe they <laughs> ate it with anchovies or something, but, uh, you know, it just has no flavor. I mean, if, if you forget to put the salt in your soup or your stew or something, you taste it, you go, this is awful. So getting the salt level right is critical. And, you know, 95% of the, our salt intake does not come from home cooking. It comes from what you buy in the supermarket or the restaurants, or whatever. Right. So you're really not consuming a lot of salt in your home cooking. So make sure it's salted well. But then finish, you know, balance it out at the end, just to, maybe just a little sugar. You know, I know when I, when I was learning to make tomato sauce back in the 70s, you know, you couldn't add sugar that was terrible, you know, you're, you're, you're a barbarian, nonsense. You know, a lot of tomatoes you get in cans, they're bitter, you know, they don't have much flavor. A little bit of sweetness uh, makes all the difference, you know, so, and then add, you know, like a cup of olive oil while you're at it, because that'll make it taste better too. But just a few tips. Well, and you were talking about presentation, or you were talking about finishing a dish. And so someone wanted to know about how valuable is presentation to you at, when um, serving a dish? Well, I tell a story about a Giuliano Bugiali, a famous Italian cook and a cookbook author and teacher. And I went to see him uh, at one of his classes in Italy back in the 80s. And um, he got very upset with one of the students who kept went on and on about presentation. And he threw his, you know, he went like, like, this, like that. He said, <laughs> properly cooked food always tastes good. You know, and I'm with him. I'm going like, you know, I understand in, in, in Japan, for example, presentation is critical and the colors and, and it's fabulous. I mean, it really does add to your pleasure of the table. But ultimately, you know, just worry about how the food tastes. Uh, and if you want to go for presentation, that's that's an extra bonus. Mm -hmm. But I would worry more about whether the shrimp tastes good than how it's presented. Right. So that's up to you. But I, I, I'm, I'm with Bugiali. You know, I mean, if, if you're in Bologna in Italy, I was there a year ago. Yeah, no one's really worried about presentation. You know, uh, that, that bolognese sauce, you know, it's, it's on the it's mixed with the pasta and it's put on a plate, you know, and you have some some cheap bread and, and a fork, you know, and then you're good to go. Right. Well, and, and you've been talking so much about different countries and different influences that you have when the world is healthy again. Do you have a new place on your list or a next place that you're going to go visit and study from? Well, uh, I would say yes. Uh, we have many places. We have to do a television show, among other things. Uh, so we will be traveling next year one way or the other. 
Uh, we'll be doing some domestic travel, West Coast, LA. We have a bunch of things lined up. South Carolina, we'll be going to maybe Nashville. Uh, there's a lot of interesting places here. But yes, uh, Crete is my next top destination. We know a cookbook author there who's phenomenal. I just interviewed her for the radio show. I just fell in love with her cooking and her stories and her father, who's still a fisherman. He goes out at night in a small boat still. Uh, he has great stories. So I want to go to Crete. Uh, we try to get to Portugal, maybe um, North Africa. I, I'm trying to go places that are not 15 hours on a plane. Yeah. So uh, around the Mediterranean, you know, anywhere is great. Um, I've, I've not been to Russia. I'd like to go. I've been to Eastern Europe, but there are places I've not been there. I'd like to go back to South America for, for more places. I'd like to go back to Vietnam uh, because I thought the food there was really, really exciting. Um, I've never I've been to China. I've been to an airport in China for three hours. I've never actually traveled in China. <laughs> so uh, Fuchsia Dunlop, who wrote Every Grain of Rice, of course, uh, is very knowledgeable about Sichuan. And, and uh, you know, if you, if you read her book, she'll tell you there are 59 different cooking methods in Sichuan cooking, which just fascinates me. Um, so I would love to go there and spend some time. So, yeah, I mean, I'd like to go back to Japan. I only spent a few days in Tokyo and that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. So I'd like to spend a couple of weeks traveling and cooking. So someday, um, hopefully next year, <laughs> we'll be doing that. Yeah, that's, I know. I, I think a lot of people are with you of hope, hoping for travel next year. We got about two more questions or so here. Um, and so one of them is obviously cooking is a true love of yours, but what other parts of business, the radio show, the TV show, um, producing cookbooks is, is your favorite to pursue? I think the radio show is, is my favorite uh, because on television, you don't really have uh, as much time as I'd like to talk to somebody. Yeah. It's more visuals than it is, you know, audio. Obviously on radio, you have no visuals, which means I get to indulge my my one hour interview fantasies talking to people. <laughs> um, and if you have that much time, you can get beyond all the obvious questions and answers to actually have a real conversation with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and when that happens, it doesn't happen all the time. But when that does happen, um, it's really extraordinary. Uh, when you, you, you get through all the, the usual suspects. Um, and you're also able to talk to anybody in the world. Um, we have lots of contributors who are interesting, like Adam Gopnik from The New Yorker, Dan Pash with the Sparkful Podcast, Dr. Aaron Carroll, who writes the New York Times a lot uh, about food and, and medicine and, and what's healthy, you know, whether is red wine good for you or not? Um, thankfully, he said, yes, that's good. Oh, good. Uh, I was going to ask. I was like, oh, we're going to sneak yeah. in that question there because <laughs> I need uh, to know. You know, we have, um, you know, the, the, the co-host of, of the word program on public television uh, radio, which is, you know, really interesting about the origins of words in, in the food world. So we get to do a whole bunch of things. Uh, we get to do it every week. Um, I love the travel for TV. That's great. Um, I'd like to do more of it. But to be able to talk to anybody is is really special, right? I mean, it's it's just wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. I want before we move on to your next presentation, I want to just ask one final question that was I really touched me here. Um, what did you learn when? writing, compiling, cookish, either some fun little fact you want to say, share something about yourself as a chef or something about writing. What did cookish teach you? Um, it, it teaches anybody to distill a recipe down to its core component parts so you see the bare bones underneath. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard uh, when you're looking at a recipe for, you know, jeweled rice with 23 ingredients, you know, to, to see all what's the saffron and the barberies and the lemon and everything else to really understand what's going on. So it forced us to get down to the, the basics of a recipe so that it, it's like music. I love music too. Once you understand the theory of it, things become clear, right? I mean, all of a sudden you go, Oh, that's what that is. I, now I understand what they're doing. Same thing with a, this book is, is you really understand what's going on with a recipe instead of just making a recipe, which makes cookies so much more fun because there is a theory there. There, there are, there are foundational concepts in this by stripping everything away, you get to those and they become clear. They sort of emerge. So that's, I think what I learned from cookish is what's really going on and what works and what doesn't. I, that's what a valuable lesson. And even somebody who's been in 
the industry for so long, the fact that you're able to share that with others and learn it yourself. Thank you so much for that. And I hear you have another recipe that you're going to share with us. So I'll turn the close up camera back on and pop her out so we can see your next treat. Uh, we're going to make a sticky chocolate cake, <laughs> the Swedish recipe. Um, we're going to do the same thing we did with the other recipe in that we're going to start by uh, with a, something we're going to heat, which is butter. Stick and a half. This is not a diet recipe. Uh, and we're going to uh, melt this down and we will brown it. So any recipe for baking where a car calls for melted butter, you can pull the same trick. You can melt the butter, but, but keep melting it until it browns, right? Until the solids drop out. Uh, and it gives you a much more complex flavor. So this is a one bowl cake. Uh, you don't need a standing mixer. You just need a whisk and a bowl and a few ingredients. It's just sort of a Betty Crocker style cake. Uh, and it's really easy because it's not a foam cake. You don't have to worry about texture. You don't have to worry about being really careful about how you mix ingredients together. Um, but it does give you this wonderful texture. It's sort of a cross between you know fudge and a fallen chocolate cake. It, it has a sticky interior actually. It's moist, but it's it's, in, it's a really interesting cake and it's dead simple. So uh, we're gonna start, I have some butter uh, here. I, I don't know if that's still on. I don't think it is. Um, it, I asked them to turn it back on, but so if someone could hit the button, then it'll work, but otherwise. <laughs> okay. If not, I'll just hold it up to camera like this. Anyway, we have um, a stick and a half of butter. There we are. That's good. Yeah. Perfect. We can see yeah. it. Okay. Um, so we're going to melt that uh, and get it till it browns. Again, you don't want to burn it, uh, but it's going to add, you know, a tremendous amount of um, uh, a flavor. You can always tell if you have butter with lots of water in it like this it does because there's a lot of bubbling going on. Um, someone asked me once, you know, is it worth spending a little more money for the higher fat butters? Uh, most supermarket butters are on 81% versus 84 or 5% or 6% and some of the better butters. I think it is worth the money. Um, and you can tell quite a, quite a difference just when you unwrap it. This looks like I'm boiling water. Uh, when that browns, we're gonna add uh, half a cup of cocoa and a cup and a quarter of uh, light brown sugar. This butter is taking forever to brown. But there it goes, it's starting to go. Now you can start to see uh, the solids are gonna start to drop out. You can see now, you can definitely see the color changing. It's good to stir it a lot. Um, it also cuts down on the foam and you can actually see the color underneath. So that's nice, that's turning a nice brown. So uh, we have half a cup of cocoa, cup and a quarter of light brown sugar, and um, Wow. 
Now that's got to sit uh, for a little bit. We have a, a replacement. Uh, we're about to add eggs to this, so obviously the eggs would cook. So we'll let that sit. Uh, meanwhile, I'll bring in um, the cooled batter. And we're going to add four eggs one at a time. So um, just a couple tips about using a whisk. Um, you know, I, I fly fish from time to time, and I notice some people when they fly fish spend 95% of the time casting which means the fly's not on the water, it's in the air. You're not gonna catch a lot of fish when the fly's 10 feet in the air. So when people use a whisk, they often go like this, right? They make that oval shape. Well, when the whisk is not in contact with the cream or the egg whites or the batter, it's not doing any good, right? It's just moving air around. So just go back and forth. Just try to keep the whisk in the batter or the egg whites or the heavy cream as much as possible. Uh, Although for this recipe, it's so forgiving, you don't have to worry about producing the perfect texture and foam. In general, when you get a cake recipe, for example, uh, you're using a stand mixer. I'm 50 seconds addition. It seems like very little. It helps you get most of the but I'll give it, you know, 10 seconds anyway. And this is definitely one of those things, you know, people take shortcuts because, you know, five seconds is a long time in the kitchen. So after five seconds, people, they add them all at once, you know, and then they go like, well, my cake didn't rise as well, or it fell in the middle. And, uh, that's because uh, you didn't have a stable foam. And these are just one of those, you know, types of recipes where you do have to kind of pay attention. Okay, we have now a uh, three-quarter cup of all-purpose flour. Uh, you could definitely use gluten-free flour, a mix here if you wanted, because there's not to be a lot of rye. Uh, you could substitute some rye flour for some of the, maybe half rye, half uh, all-purpose. Uh, some chips, of course, half a cup, a little bit of salt. Um, in desserts, especially with chocolate, uh, always add salt. Salt, you know, I'm a big salt uh, fan here, but, but salt makes all the difference, even in desserts. Um, chocolate desserts really punches up the flavor. Uh, a couple other little tips. Um, uh, Claire Patak owns a bakery in East London. We visited her, we first started Milk Street in the first year uh, to film there. And she, she taught me some things that are really helpful. One is when you beat egg whites, don't beat them to stiff peaks, um, not even to peaks. The, the peak will sort of fold over, they're very soft. You want the beaten egg whites to be the same texture as the batter to which you're folding them. Number two, when you fold in the egg whites, be extremely gentle and don't fold them all the way in. And finally, um, Anytime you're doing a batter, um, let's say with the flour going in, the flour doesn't have to be totally mixed into the batter. You can still still, still see streaks of flour um, uh, because when you bake, uh, all those ingredients will magically come together. So again, in this cake, it doesn't really matter because it's, a, it's not going to rise that much. But uh, if you're very gentle with the egg whites, folding egg whites in, folding the flour in, uh, then you're going to end up with better structure and also a higher rise at the end of the day. So this is a prepared pan. It's been sprayed. There's parchment at the bottom. Um, it's going to go in a low oven, a 325 oven, for half an hour-ish, <laughs> maybe 35 minutes. Um, just a word about that, by the way. Um, you know, oven temperatures, even ours, are... Um, not to be trusted. And it's not because we're bad people, it's just because your oven and our ovens are never gonna be the same. Um, uh, our ovens might be 50 degrees off from yours. Years ago, I did a test of a bunch of people. Uh, we set the ovens at 350. Some were 310, some were 390, 400. So there can be as much as 80 or 90 degrees difference between two people's ovens. So 
halfway through, check, turn things around, um, and check and check and check and check. Um, and always, uh, if you're doing a cake or cookies, take them out before they're perfectly baked. There's a baking time, cooking time in an oven, and there's cooking time outside the oven. So when you take cookies out, like chocolate chip cookies, they should be in the center, totally un unbaked, really. This, the, the edges should be start to set, but not the center. Cakes also may not be perfectly uh, baked. You know, they say put a toothpick in the center, forget it. You should almost always see something sticking to that toothpick. If, if, you, if you put it in and take it out uh, and it's perfectly clean, you probably overbaked it. So take it out of the oven because it's going to continue to cook when it comes out, uh, even on a cooling rack. So uh, avoiding overbaking is critical. You know, Thanksgiving is coming up. If you do a pumpkin pie, the center inch and a half or two inches should still be not set. Uh, and so take it out. And you'll notice after just six or seven minutes that pie, the center is going to set. So a custard pie, and pumpkin pie is a custard cup pie, uh, should be underbaked. The center should still be loose. It should still jiggle. Take it out, set it on a rack, and a few minutes later, it's going to set up for you. Uh, and then you'll have a perfectly set pie. But if you keep baking it to the center is perfectly set, you'll notice the outside rises up and gets cracked, uh, which means that the egg proteins then are over baking. And uh, it'll still be good, but it won't be as good as if you baked it properly. Oh, my gosh. And through ah! the magic of, yes, there we are. And then, and then you just throw it in the magic oven, you bring it back, and everything's fine. <laughs> uh, oh, wow, you can put confection sugar, or you can also put a little cocoa on it if you like. Um, there you go. Now, I, I'm not going to vouch for sticky chocolate cake. Your mouth's open, by the way. Sticky I know. Chocolate I, cake. I'm sorry. I, did, did you <laughs> see the drool? Like, we'll just, we'll, yeah, sorry. The we'll it's not. nice, but the chocolate cake. Uh, so, you know, caramel shrimp and chocolate cake. I'm not sure if that's the ideal menu, but anyway, they're two interesting recipes. They're, they just seem delicious. I'm so, I feel like I'm, again, I repeat my boyfriend is the cook and I'm just going to like bring this book and be like, please make this. Uh, <laughs> we know what we're having for dinner. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for this, Chris. Thank you for sure, my pleasure having these wonderful virtual demonstrations for us. We haven't had someone do a cooking demonstration yet on our virtual events. And, um, you know, you guys are so well equipped at Milk Street um, with the variety of platforms that you're on. It's really great to see someone using this virtual platform as um, showing us something different and something new um, that we couldn't have necessarily done in the bookstore. So thank you for that. Well, we love independent bookstores. So we love Tattered Cover. I've been there many, many times over the years. So uh, all the best. I hope you have a great year next year. Well, and we greatly appreciate it. It's, it goes the same for you and all the potential travels that you have. And so everyone can purchase their copy of Cookish. Um, you can purchase it at tatterdcover.com um, online in your pajamas if you don't want to come into the store. But you are welcome to come into any of our four locations um, and get your copy there if you have your mask on. Uh, well, if Chris and company will just hang out here, we'll close this out. But I just want to thank you guys again for shopping local, supporting local businesses. The reason that we're here is because of you. And the reason that we're able to have amazing events like this one, where my mouth just continues to water as I look at that cake. Uh, <laughs> I, we continue to do it because of you and because of your support. So thank you. And we just cannot... We're just so grateful. So everyone, once again, you can buy Cookish online or in store at Tattered Cover. And uh, we will just say thank you and we hope you all stay safe. Happy reading and happy cooking. <laughs>